Hey everybody, what's up? And welcome to the Arborist Blueprint Podcast. I'm Kurt the Arborist. Check me out on Instagram. Got links to all my things there. Uh, today we got a cool guest, Emmy Weckwert from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Emmy is uh, an expert on doing tree work with bikes. Okay. <laughs> he's a cargo bike guy. Uh, he's bike packing. He's doing all sorts of stuff. He's an instructor with Abora Culture Canada. So he knows his stuff, um, has his own business, the Crooked Tree Arborist. And uh, he's about to host an urban forestry conference in Edmonton called Spoken Loam. So he's got all sorts of cool stuff on the go. Uh, let's let him in and uh, we'll let him tell you why and what is going on. The Arborist Blueprint Podcast is proudly sponsored by Atmos Tree. Atmos Tree is a regenerative alliance founded by myself, Kurt the Arborist, that brings arborists together to plant more trees than we are removing. The 2 to 1 Tree Cycle Program is an off site tree replacement initiative that is funded 100% by small recycling fees that we charge our clients when they require a tree removal. These funds cover all costs from seedlings all the way to monitoring. There is zero cost to arborists that join the Alliance. When you join the Alliance, there are also multiple benefits for your business to take advantage of. Atmos Tree is a green marketing tool that can help you win more quotes and attract new conscious clients. We provide you with pre-made line item titles and descriptions for your quotes and invoices that explain the recycling fee and direct them to Atmos Tree for more information. We provide PDF info cards and thank you cards you can optionally attach to your quotes and your invoices. We offer a free branding toolkit complete with professional logos, badges to advertise your affiliation on your website through email communications or other social media channels. We'll mail you decals to add to your equipment that display the two to one tree cycle badge. We add your logo to our website with other Alliance members, which backlinks to your website. We also share collaborative posts through social media to advertise your new affiliation through Atmos Tree and Kurt the Arborist Instagram pages to boost awareness. If you are interested in more information about Atmos Tree, please visit atmostree.org and fill out our contact form. You can also follow us on Instagram at atmostreeorg. So please join our growing alliance of arborists and contract climbers from around the world. Together, we can make an impact and be responsible for planting more trees than we remove. It's free and Atmos Tree takes care of everything. Thanks, guys. Now back to the podcast. Enjoy. Thanks for having me, Kurt. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah dude, no problem. Thanks for coming on. How have you been? I know we've been trying to nail it down for a bit. You've been a busy guy. Uh, yeah, too. I've uh, been busy. Just mix of vacation and work. So hard to Yeah, lots of moving around. Spot. Yeah. Yeah, and I <laughs> thought you were back home yeah. in Edmonton today. Uh, that's why I got the times mixed nope. up, but... That's okay. Not yet. Haven't been home in yeah, a while, you... actually. No, yeah, you were gone. Well, you were gone before you went on a bike packing trip, right? And then, did you just tie that into like between a couple courses? Basically, yeah. So I did a course in Grand Prairie. I got home and literally the next morning, packed all the bikes in. And uh, we'd bought in tickets to see Messi play against Win- uh, the Vancouver Whitecaps, but he didn't show up, but we had tickets anyways. And we were tying that into a little bit of a vacation. And so nice. we did a it's pretty chill uh, route on Vancouver Island called the Couch and Eight. Highly recommend oh, it yeah. if, if, you've, uh, if you've never bike packed or if you just want something really chill and easy going it's a good uh two or three days lots of camping and hotels and airbnb on the way if you don't want to camp and lots of spots to refill your water and stop for beer so it's really nice chill little like it's like a figure eight it's pretty cool so oh yeah you start in victoria you go up um up the souk wilderness trail and then you get all the way to cowichan lake and then you kind of do a figure eight back and you end up back in Duncan and come back and yeah, it's fun. Was it like, uh, like a gravel, kind of like a packed gravel type trail? It was mostly, yeah, there's a tiny, tiny bit of maybe like single track, but nothing, uh, I wouldn't say, I'd say it was, I would classify it as a gravel, any gravel bike or mountain bike could do that. Okay. Pretty. How many hours in uh, like distance and stuff do you like to go in a day doing that? Well, I was uh, with my partner, and it was her first uh, long distance trip. Um, so we did about four or five hours of riding a day. So nothing crazy. 
I, mean, I oh, think okay. the most we did in one day was like 75k. Um, that's pretty good though, I mean, also, especially if it's like off road. Yeah, yeah, it was good, uh, and the grade is really nice on that, so you can really get cooking if you want to. Um, there's a tiny bit of climbing at the very beginning, but it was not anything like when I go with some of my friends. I don't know why they we sign up for these suffer fests, and I don't think that uh, <laughs> that that would fly. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that that my partner so I'm not saying that Jenny wouldn't want to do that I'm sure she she would at some point but not for your first trip you want to have fun like my first bike backing trip like legit one it was like traumatic like oh we we did fine it wasn't actually like just too far it was hard it was just too steep and I didn't I packed so much stuff I didn't need yeah and uh we started at this hill and I was I, I looked up and I was like we we all stopped and we literally didn't think we were going to make it up this like gravel hill there's like big trucks it's like rural gravel Kamloops area it's called the grassy uh, grassy loops or something like that it's, it's amazing but uh, now that I know what I like I have a better setup it's a lot more fun. And I made it up the hill anyways, just fine. Like <laughs> stayed on my bike the whole time. But at first yeah. you're just not ready for it and then you're like, Oh Oh yeah, fun. man. I did I did a bike packing trip, uh not off road, uh, but I took my cycle cross bike and got like the big bag under the seat like you had kind of and um hooked it all up and you know, made some easier gears on there and then went to the west coast. It was like seven or eight days. And uh, oh, I had never That's done anything like that either, but I, I researched tons, so I like really slimmed it down because I didn't have a lot of room. So I think like that was okay, but like a day before I left, I saw a guy bike packing on the highway, kind of the way I was gonna go. We were just like out at Ghost Lake and in the parking lot, and he's like pulled over. He's like emptying his bike and just like throwing out all of this food. He had like massive bags of rice and all these things. He's just like throwing half <laughs> of his gear into the garbage <laughs> and just looking depressed. And he like just started that day. Like I think he only made it like 50 kilometers so far. I was like, oh man, what am I in for? <laughs> this isn't good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's but, cool though. Once you get on the road, like you experience like all the smells and the sounds and like if you've driven down some of the roads that you bike down, it's just like a different world. It's like, yeah, it's not the same place. It's completely different. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And I like it for the fact that, I mean, probably like anything, like you wouldn't have to be a bike packer or whatever, but just taking those trips that just totally mix up the daily life routine, especially with like fitness or something that gets you off your phone, puts you in nature, you know, there's like that left and right motor movement which has something to yeah. do good with your brain. I don't know. It just, you, you really remember awesome. it. Do you like, I remember like almost like every day from the whole trip that I did. Like, it's just, even though it was a very short period of time in my life, it's like, or even, even one night overnight hikes that I've done with some buddies. It's like, it's, uh, it's on the list of one of the things that I really enjoy and remember from the past, even though it's only like one day, you know, but it really sticks in there. Something yeah, about it. It's like, I think it's because it's kind of how we're meant to move. When we take a train or a bus or or drive somewhere, like we don't experience the space we're moving through. Like it, we, we're separated from it. And even other cars, yeah. we don't see those as like other people. Really, they're just other cars. Oh yeah. And yeah, you know, eventually our brain does. Um, it's called. Uh, motor normativity our brain starts to tune out all the negative things um associated with driving and at some point i think if you do ever and we all you know if you bike or walk we all we all walk right we're all pedestrians yeah. at some point of our day um but when Hopefully. we do get that experience to like move yeah that's true we all we all have some sort of movement that's outside of our cars but we all mostly drive cars even even myself just this world we live in that's just you know you can sort of minimize you can become car light which is 
awesome if you if you have that opportunity but it doesn't always work out but when you do it's awesome it's just you feel better you feel more connected to your community mm -hmm. and and yeah it's amazing so yeah it's something just like getting out like i know i get down and whatever and i guess i feel like to have those high times of full inspiration and creativeness and whatever it's like balanced out by these times that are just kind of like I don't know, so mundane and like low and I got to force myself to get outside even if it's just like walking the dog or even as that like going to do a tree quote or something like just get out there and like talk to a human and look at a tree even though it's work and then come back and like, wow, I feel better. <laughs> I love this yeah. job. It's totally true. And even for us, because we work in trees, I think sometimes it's hard for us to actually disconnect the work brain from trees. Mm. Like we might like look at trees and just only see like the aspects that like you might see a tree that's kind of like to us looks sketchy. Yeah. But that's it's you know it, and even if it is like there's still aspects to that that because we're so trained to like solve those problems sometimes we don't get to experience like this always would happen to me on this walk that I used to do um on the Sunshine Coast and my my partner has a uh, relatives there and we would go do okay, this walk, and there's a bunch of uh seashell oh nice okay yeah so we would go do this walk and there was this douglas fir had been there for years and it's just like leaning really heavily and like there's nothing wrong with the tree it's been like that for a long time but as an arborist you look at it and you're like I, it just causes you anxiety even though you don't have to do anything, it's like it's okay. Yeah. Like you don't have to do anything. This it's all good, but like, it's a it's a probably true that for a lot of us, walking through the forest isn't always easy. It's not always easy for us to disconnect from the fact that the trees also like provide for us in many ways economically, and mm -hmm. sometimes it is nice to be able to mindfully just experience it as just another bystander and I think that sometimes it's weird that we lose that as people who work in trees yeah like you can't just be a regular person and just enjoy it for what it is because you're you're like over analyzing everything I know that happens to me a lot with other things too and I know what you mean and I haven't it's not too hard for me I think in forest because I can justify it's like natural but I know what you mean, like we're we're used to looking at certain insects or diseases and you're like, Oh, this forest it's got hypoxylin canker. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, or... I guess wait a, I guess wait a minute, that's part of nature too. But we're just used to demonizing certain things in like the urban environment that it's hard, like you said, to disconnect just going for a walk with your family and seeing everything and being like, Ooh, this this forest isn't gonna make it <laughs> Yeah, or like yeah, and then you see all the conks on the aspen. Mm hmm But, I mean, uh, that's kind of what it's supposed to be, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's all part of nature. It's like, well, I mean, nature, we don't need to define it because, you know, it's everywhere. But yeah, I guess it, our it is experience what it is. of a forest, yeah. Like a forest. Yeah, it's us so that puts complex. the label on it of, of right or wrong. Yeah, or in order and not in order or like i guess productive versus non-productive yeah so how do, or in decline how do you i did a quick little intro about uh that you have your own business the crooked tree arborist yeah uh, in edmonton and i don't i've never seen your business and how you do it day to day but i know you're using cargo bikes when you can or i don't know how much but how do you run your tree company different and how did that come about? Awesome. Well, thanks for asking. Um, so basically, in 2022, it would have been, I had the opportunity to, uh, well, the way it kind of happened as far as cargo bikes go is I was I went to a friend's, uh, well, there's my funky hotel chair. Um, I went to a friend's <laughs> garage sale, like bike part swap, Cool little community event and there was a blue 
uh, Larry vs. Harry Bullet. I didn't know that's what it was at the time, but it was this cool cargo bike. And we were all ready for years. A couple friends and I were like, oh, it would be so sick to have this, like, prototype, like, urban arborist who, like, has all his ropes and chainsaws and all the gear that they would need to climb trees and do storm damage and all that. And this was, like, back when I worked at the city. And I was like, okay. this would be so cool because we spend so much time in these stupid, stinky bucket trucks and we have to cut our way into the canopy and they're idling the whole time. And bucket trucks are great for many reasons, but I do think that one of the biggest reasons that our industry uses them is because we don't have to train people as much. I know mm-hmm. a lot of people will not like that statement, but it's true. It's like it's a lot harder to become a competent climber. And even when you are like a really good climber, there's still days where you're going to like suck at throw line. But oh, yeah, it all the idea all started back then. And so then we had kind of a couple friends and I who were helping me do some tree work. We kind of started building some with like cargo fork. And it was fine, but it was like, it didn't really work. And then we saw this bike, and it's a front-loaded cargo bike. Like, they, I guess in Europe, they call them Bach feats. But okay. uh, I didn't I didn't realize how much weight they could take. And they can take around 400 pounds, minus the weight of the rider. Um, and so I went to the bike shop and asked about them. And they had electric ones, or electric oh. assist, right? You pedal assist, yep. so you pedal and... and they were super stoked on the possibility of using them, me using them for work. And I'd already been doing quotes by normal bike all the time. Cause like you show yep. up to a quote and you don't know what you're going to get. Um, nowadays I charge for like in-person assessments, like before I didn't. So at least I as get opposed a bike to right like, uh, as opposed to like a photo or just dropping by at your convenience kind of thing when they're not home. Yeah, so it's either like I'll drop by it at when I can and I'll give you a courtesy knock and a text message letting you know I'm there. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I have your consent, I'll take pictures of your trees and I'll access uh, the trees so that I can have a look at them. If you want an in-person quote, then there's a charge for that because, uh, you know, yeah. you have to you have to set some boundaries with people. Um, yeah, totally. And it's worked out great. But as far as the cargo bikes, well, that's how it started, right? That's like, that was the moment I was like, man, these could really work. So, and then it kind of snowballed into this, like, oh, okay, well, if we do this and maybe we should get like a a trailer, okay, well, like what trailer should we get? Oh, and are they, what are they rated to? And fast forward to now, it's not much different than a normal uh, day of work for any normal arborist. If you can... You don't need to be in crazy shape to use these cargo bikes, but we load all our gear according to what job we need. Um, we've taken everything from like big chainsaws and GRCS and all the rigging lines. Um, to give you an idea of the capacity, it can fit like the same amount of stuff you would fit in your truck. There's no reason you wouldn't be able to, but we do have to set uh, a bit of a radius. So instead of saying, yeah, we'll bike right. out, everywhere it's not really the case like i try to like uh reel in my clientele to Mm -hmm. a certain radius from where i live and it's starting to work out really well because now most of my work is you know within a 20 minute max bike ride um sweet and i still use a i still use a cargo van for a lot of work and i'm working on getting a, a smaller shredder i still like up until not too long ago, I did have a normal tow behind chipper, chipper, BC, uh, a seven inch chipper. So nothing massive. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, the way we do the work isn't much different. Uh, the big limitations with doing work by cargo bike is you have to either stage your cleanup or, or like, have that scheduled in a different way um what ends up happening often is the cargo bike like i've created a sort of flow chart for people to 
to use that because there's quite a few people that are starting to use uh, these bikes for work in general not just tree work like if you can do it in tree work in Edmonton like yeah you could do it any like moderately dense city in North America could do any trade by cargo bike if they wanted to and I guess the biggest benefits that I saw were it was really free and like to the point and efficient advertising because the people who see you on bikes usually oh, yeah. live close to where imagine. you're biking yeah yeah they live close to where you're biking um which is a huge benefit because it's like literally doing what google can't as far as ads go um and they often live near car uh bike infrastructure so there's always a sort of intersection between at least and and hopefully all neighborhoods get decent bike infrastructure um but we do know that there's a correlation of where there is bike infrastructure and mature trees. Um, and there's a link between that. And I happen to live in a neighborhood with pretty mature trees. So uh, I, I really do benefit from that. Like any sort of elm pruning and elm season or any like large tree pruning. Most of the time you're not taking massive amounts of debris out anyways. Um, right isn't like some of the more mature trees you're trying to err on the side of like 10 percent or less like really trying to keep the stress low on old mature trees i don't know if sure if that's true for some of the ones in your area or, or what but that would reduce the volume i guess overall for you too yeah and, and and we try to keep it manageable as far as volume goes anyways like we don't it's a little late to change the structure of a tree at that point anyways so most of our work is in the periphery so you know you get as high as you can and as far out on the tips as you can so there's nothing about that that says oh you need a car or a truck that's like if you're climbing right right? all you need is your climbing harness the ropes that you'd be using your hand saw maybe an electric chainsaw and then with I've been in talks with uh chipper well it's more of a shredder company called elite so that's e-l-i-e-t um and they build these really efficient shredders and the difference is is they chop up the wood like like when you chop wood so it's not cross cut like uh oh, okay. disc chipper and that decomposes a little bit faster but it's also they're small enough that you can fit them in backyards and most of uh, my clientele end up keeping their chips, so it ends up working so, out really well. Oh, that's well a great for idea. Our business yeah. model. So, could you so, push this thing into like someone's backyard, or pull it with your bike, whatever, go through the gate? Yeah. Bring it in the back, and then you just work that in when you go and do your quotes, and you're like, obviously, we're different. We're running cargo bikes. We're super environmentally friendly. Like rethinking the industry. You kind of sell them on this whole thing. They like it, so then they're probably more open to things like, hey, can we process all the wood and leave it here for? firewood for you or your family or friends if you don't want it and then um you know or for whatever they want to use it for and then yeah all their chips i mean you could replace that easily by back into their garden beds or or wherever especially if you educate them on how beneficial they are yeah and especially these chips come out a little bit different than your normal chipper they they they're along uh the grain so they're not cross cut so they tend to decompose a little bit faster um, Does it make long strips, but, like when you kind of like rip cut? Of it? Yeah, like kind long, of. like uh, uh, yeah, yeah. At um, and we'll get to that. But if uh, if I get the chance to compare the two, I'll I'll send you some photos. But the big thing that I've noticed is most people don't. Most people who call us because like the bike community is tight in Edmonton and in every city, like just like the tree community tends to be tree work community at least and tree fanatics like every city has a group of people that are really into trees and gardening and horticulture permaculture um a lot of like really cool movements and the bike community is similar and so a lot of the people who do call us because they've seen our bike they might not be in the bike community 
and they might not even know that that's how we do all of our work. And then some people who call right. us never even find out that we use cargo bikes because the service level really isn't any different because we still have, you know, a normal normal access to chippers and all that through our community. And up until like a couple months ago, I still had a chipper, but I'm just trying to go in a different direction now. So I like to see it as this, it's like a different tool to transport yourself in, in urban places, or if you do any trail maintenance or like quotes or consultation, it's something that your clientele won't really notice the difference. But there also is that benefit that if they do want to hire someone who's a little bit less uh, car centric, I guess you could say, then, you know, we are that option. But that's not yeah. our only you... focus, but yeah. Do you find that there's more, I guess you'd call it environmentally conscious clients out there that are that are actually looking for that or is it uh you know like they, they're, they're happy either way you know what i mean like do you do you find they're they're knowledgeable on the fact that you don't have to have a blaring loud chipper and saws and bucket truck for every kind of tree job because i mean i have people contact me all the time and they're like yeah bring your chipper in your bucket truck and i was just running like a trailer and a pickup and i'm and I'm thinking, man, I never want to get a chipper because I, I honestly just hate the noise. I don't want the noise and the exhaust and the maintenance and the whatever. And I'm like, I'm getting by it's on a trailer. It's so yeah. easy. Anybody can throw it in there. No one's going to get sucked in. Like, it's just, it's, you know, so yeah. do you do you find there's more environmentally conscious clients up there? Or are you, like, creating that that movement, you know, like creating your own niche market with those people just by being there? Hmm, that's a great question. I think there's a bit of both. So I think that people a lot for a long time in our industry, it's like we always start off with like chainsaw courses and and all that. And that's fine because that gets you into the industry. And, and it's not really a, a criticism or a complaint, but it's just like a note because and if we look at the tools we're given and and this sort of like normal progression in tree care it's like but you know get the chainsaws start with like removals well, obviously start yeah. with some training little pickup that's truck. the most important thing yeah start Hopefully. with the best thing you can do is get an arb can course if you're in <laughs> canada and then and then you get your you know your pickup truck or if you're lucky maybe you have uh maybe some a bit of generational wealth or something and you can buy a bucket truck and and a chipper and there's that sort of progression towards like bigger equipment bigger 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 and a lot of the problems with urban trees aren't solved by cutting things you know they're just not solved yeah. by chainsaws but they're the tools yeah. that we're endowed they're they're usually solved by maybe assessment consultation and, and being a little bit more creative. So I think to answer the question, there are people who are becoming more aware of the value of trees because the value of trees has always existed. Unfortunately, the only way we have to quantify it is monetarily. And I think that leaves a lot, in my opinion, it leaves a lot to be desired. Like totally. I, I think ideas like ecological personhood and and that sort of there's a lot of rivers that have been given rights and i think that eventually trees will be a little bit more respected um but that's not to put them like before us or or anything like that it's just a sort of observation that there is a little bit of uh a market i guess you could call it but more than anything there's just people who see trees as characters in their landscape and lives. So if you show up with a little bit more of a, I guess you could say gentle mode of transportation or conscious mode of transportation, they appreciate that. And they also appreciate less noise and 
honestly a lot of arboriculture's tools big tools that are designed to dispose of trees do just that they just dispose of trees and that isn't yeah. necessarily our job as arborists a lot of times it is unfortunately what we have to do and there's yeah. always going to be need for someone who's really good at removals but for myself i find a lot more uh social reward and community building in educating people on trees don't get me wrong i love doing a technical removal i, I love mm -hmm. that sort of thing but with with what I'm seeing in my community, there's a lot less need. Like, I, I, frankly, I can't compete with people who have massive chippers and big bucket trucks, and I don't want to because then I have to get storage for them. Then I have to have a massive crew, and yeah. those are all things that I just don't. Nothing wrong with them. Just personally, that's not the road I want to go down. So yeah. for me having a, a, a van that has all my tools in it or a truck that has all my tools in it, small truck or van and a couple cargo bikes solves all my problems and a small chipper that I can fit in my garage and I can get a lot of work done and work that I can come back to every other year. So, Yeah, man, I, I battle with that too. And I always do and I always come back to it as like, okay, What's the next step? I gotta grow, make my job a little bit easier. And you know, this year I got like an old six inch bandit chipper and um, it has been beneficial, but I mean, I don't actually chip a lot because my business model too, like in my area, it's not as bike friendly here in, in Cochrane. Like they're developing it like crazy and there's not a lot of connecting bike paths and you have to go through like a dangerous intersection to try and get anywhere. But anyway, um, I just, never know where to draw that line. There's like that tipping point of like, hey, now you're invested so much into equipment and then you need to get a busier schedule because I'm, you know, with Atmos Tree and other things I got going on, I'm trying to balance my time with those. So I'm like, okay, well now I might need someone to kind of look after tree work for me. So I got to train them and I love training and there's people that want to learn. So that's great. But then to keep them employed and have enough work, now I have to get more business. So it's like, hey, well now I need this chipper because I can't have them trying to empty a trailer every single job they do. So now it's like pushed me into Calgary a little bit. And I swore I would never go into Calgary, you know, to the big city to do tree work. But I'm like, well, if it's not me, I can have my employees do it here eventually. So I'm just going to go through this like struggle year of trying to figure this out. <laughs> you know, so I'm sort of like chasing that, that carrot, like we're talking about. But at the same time, I'm, it's, it's for the purpose of me not <laughs> being involved. And it's so, yeah. it's so difficult, but it's, to do that, to have that battle, because it is easy to think just to turn around and be like, oh, I'll go lease a truck and a chipper and get two guys and I'll just blast some, some uh, Google ads and whatever out in Calgary and they can just run around all day and I'll just go do quotes. But then, then you find yourself working day after day, putting in these hours and running this monotonous sort of job as opposed to focusing on kind of the why you're doing it. And like you said, like, connecting those people and even educating them individually and just spending that time outside and not worried about having to get out of there as fast as you can to get to the next one. And I think it's other forms of capital that we both maybe relate with to each other with like, like money is one form of capital and it's a big one because we, I mean, that must make the world go round really, but yeah, there is other forms of capital, like that social capital being with people and having a good relationship and, whatever, I think I did a permaculture course and there was a whole list of types of capital and I didn't even realize it or ever think of them in that way. But um, maybe people just, you know, if they took a permaculture course, I guess they would realize that there are other forms and trying to appreciate them more. Or at the end of the day, realize and reflect like, what was the best part of my day? And it was like, oh, it was actually meeting that person and learning about what they did for a living and we connected and it was like really cool and you learned something new. And, you know, it's not even about like the tree that you pruned that day or how much money you made or, or whatever so maybe some self-assessments on on what brings you value and joy in your life and trying to balance that with your tree work and not getting caught up in that rat race of being bigger and better and crushing the competition and falling into this cyclical removals traditional tree company yeah um, this paradigm of endless growth we see it yeah, everywhere and though, i mean right? like yeah 
and it's hard to judge it and say it's bad because I don't want people that listen to feel like that's a bad thing because probably the majority of people that listen to do that and that takes a lot of skill too in building a company and scaling it and whatever and that's oh, it's what we've been taught to do and it's how the, yeah. the world works. So I mean yeah. that kind of brings me to another question for you is that if someone was listening and they're like you know they have that type of tree company or where they're mm-hmm. going all over the place like most people do or they're new and they're like um, maybe I can consider doing something like you're doing with the cargo bikes or just kind of rethink their process. Um, do you think someone could do it being new or is it something that evolves from starting your business and doing more of a traditional style, you know, getting your foundation set, getting some awareness in your community? You know, it will naturally happen probably locally to you because people will see you, but then then you have that luxury of being like, hey, now I'm going to go niche because I have the business and I have the background, all my trainings in place and all whatever. Now I can kind of be more selective on what I do. And I feel like that's kind of maybe the natural progression. But do you think people can start new doing this kind of thing or do they have to build up? I think it is It is quite possible. I, I can't stress enough like how important a lot of the mentors that taught me good tree work first were uh to me and how important that and how that has impacted the quality of work I do and so to answer your question in a more roundabout way to get to the answer kind of have to do a little bit of of jockeying one way to get there but I think that there's a couple lenses that you can view tree work through. Then like you were saying earlier, there's different types of capital. There's different types of lenses that we can look at our work through. One of them has nothing to do with money at all. And it has to do with the quality of work. That we'd, and a lot of people will disagree with this. But there, there is fundamentally a, a lens that exists when we view a tree that is an ecological lens and usually ecology is tied in with social things as well so the social ecological lens and that is basically I'm looking at this environment and this ecosystem and I'm trying to uh, be part of it and and not just have low impact on it but maybe do my best to better it right then there's the monetary one which you need so that you can offer good quality work and in order to offer good quality work you need to if you're an owner operator like yourself or myself um, which I think is an awesome way to go um, you need to limit how much you're actually doing because if you try to do everything then your quality starts to like slip and Mm -hmm. and eventually you're not you're not able to make the best pruning cuts you're not able to talk to people and have them understand why we're doing what to a certain tree and when we're doing it and so to answer that question I think if you do have the the training and the experience and more than anything you care about your community and your trees yeah you could definitely start out with a cargo bike if you live in a dense enough place and and you think that you can manage your 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 clientele by cargo bike uh, it's very low overhead as a matter of fact a lot of businesses who want to expand and not buy a new truck and a new chipper have been buying a cargo bike and a really popular uh, cargo bike trailer called the Carla cargo that has a 200 kilogram weight limit and that's how they build their crews because they don't need to get vehicle insurance. There's still other insurance you need, but it's nowhere near as expensive. And you can have, you can buy for the price of one truck. You can buy four cargo bikes, and that's four arborists. So if those arborists are really well trained, then that's the quality, right? And that's where it is. So yeah, I I do really think that if you have the desire to learn and you have the training, you could totally start where with what I'm myself or Tiger uh, Divine Arboriculture in, in Vancouver and there's a couple people in the States 
I know there's even some really legendary tree climbers. Uh, Kevin Bingham uses his bike. Uh, Mark Bridge from Tree Imagineers in Europe, they use uh, their bikes. Um, one of our fellow trainers, DJ, actually got to be on one of those crews for a while. And so it's not a new idea, right? It's another yeah. tool. And I always say, like, you don't have to just do one thing or the other. Um, right. I'm still going to need my motor vehicle for a lot of the work I do. And I'm still going to need a chipper for a lot of the work I do. But I, to, all, to that, I also say, build community with your fellow arborists. Instead of competing with each other, try to collaborate. And then that way we can uh, hopefully uh, compete with the larger companies who don't always have the best uh, interest in our urban forest health. Dare yeah. I say that? Just, I mean, it's natural probably for that to happen too because they're big companies, so there's a lot of chains of people. You know, one person gets yeah. the phone call, then another person does the quote, another person shows up, then it's seasonal employees helping. You know, it's just the like, communication and the care, like where does it start and where does it end with all these people? It's just everyone touches yeah. it a little bit. and. So I think quality gets lost in that sense, or you know, you're just you're there for the day to do your job, and someone else is telling you what to do, and it's kind of how it is. So running your own thing, I think you bring the caring in, and the compassion. And I like what you said about, you know, you don't have to just do one or the other. And it kind of makes sense. Like a light bulb went off for me there, where it's like if you're already a company that has your truck and your chipper and your whatever, and you're doing stuff, and you got lots of jobs, and you're looking to expand. This could be a cool way to expand and just add on to your existing company because you probably have yeah. enough clients already built up where you could like have even just one day a week or two days a week where you're going to rip on your cargo bike by yourself and give the other guys a day off or you're just going to add that cargo bike to your existing fleet and just pick and choose your super small jobs you know, near your, near your place that you can manage until you get uh, your feet wet and everything and either leave that pile of debris there for the other crew to swing by after and grab it and chip it if you need to and you could do a ton of work obviously as we know by yourself like like contract climbers running in like tiny little hatchback cars going and taking out massive trees just with their small amount of gear you could you could run around and do that and contract climb for other guys um yeah like th there's a lot of options there of what you could do for sure totally totally and like other benefits are like you can roll right up to the tree, unload all your gear, get the tree out of the drop <laughs> yeah. or the bike out of the drop zone, and then like lock it up or maybe you don't need to lock it up. Um, and sometimes there's no parking like where I work sometimes uh, downtown Edmonton yeah. or like uh, Old Strathcona. Garneau, oh, no, there's there's no parking. There's just like yeah. What about a bucket you, truck and a chipper? Hey, it's like good luck. Yeah, so you can't even do that. So what you do? You get is permits you to close a lane down, or yeah, you got your OSCAM permits or whatever. So I mean, I think that it's a sick way to grow your business if you do want to grow it, and you can. There's another model that we don't quite have set up in North America called the hub and spoke model, and the hub and spoke model is basically this idea that there's hubs throughout the city and that's where people take their uh, vehicles right and a lot of these hubs coincide with like your eco stations or uh, your waste collection stations and then in between those you connect them with uh, micro mobility or smaller vehicles right so for tree work sometimes you can create something called a floating hub and spoke model um, you don't have to use a cargo bike to do it. You can use a small vehicle and your uh, debris disposal truck or your chipper truck, whatever you want to call it. Um, and you can go out as a crew to a suburb. One crew can start over here. The other crew can go do some small tree pruning, some young tree training. And if it's enough debris that they add up, they leave it at their floating hub is what I call it, a floating hub and spoke model. Mm -hmm. And and then that way you can do more work and divide and conquer, so to say. And so there's some really cool setups where people have their cargo van with the chipper inside. 
because it's a high roof and the chipper's on tracks and it goes inside and then they have a cargo bike there and when they get to wherever they're going they split up and do some work there's a lot of suburbs that like are hard to to get to for some and there's a really cool company actually out here in Edmonton called City Tree shout out to them they got a sick yeah. uh, hatchback set up which is so cool so like it doesn't have to be uh, a cargo bike but it can be a uh, car light or truck light yeah. so to say our bar culture like we don't need trucks to do tree work we don't like it's not a need it's a luxury and in some places you do need them but in the city or if you're maintaining trail systems parks canada has been using uh e-bikes to maintain yeah. a lot of their trails and um i don't know if any of them would be listening to this but i give some shout outs <laughs> of course they are they're, they're probably that. subscribed <laughs> <laughs> uh, City Tree yeah, guys, yeah, so, I, I've talked to them a few times. Um, so are you yeah, saying you kind of like, have them on? They're sweet guys, yeah. Yeah, we've chatted a few times on Instagram. They seem like they they're good guys. Um, so are you kind of saying more like instead of having your bucket truck or whatever it might be, go to like every job and sporadic all over the place just as they come up, like pre-plan it so that you're going to like a certain region of your city and you go there if you have to with like one truck that's going to kind of maybe do all the debris for you but then your other crew guys can kind of split up and go and start working at the same time like like that sort of thing where you're just staying more regional and yeah and not is that what you meant kind of yeah so like like you're saying like you go into calgary and you want to do work but you're based at a cochran right so yeah rather than going out there for one job which nobody does that anyways they usually try to schedule other ones in yeah but if you have two crews out there, um, not all of them need to have. And this is nothing new. This is nothing complicated. It's yeah. just another way of getting more work done. And so the cargo bikes excel at this. They're not the best in the suburbs because the suburbs are pretty spread out. But this yeah. works really well in in more dense Denser. parts of. Yeah, okay. even even like mid density. So. Yeah. This would make sense because I have like kind of my first day in Calgary. I started advertising out in the, the fringes of Calgary to these to these two communities, and uh, my first day is coming up I think on Wednesday. So I have like two or three jobs that I quoted from photos. I didn't even have to go there, which is awesome. And then you know which sometimes I just kind of take a hit on sometimes, but overall I think the time that I save from having to drive to quotes, it's worth it. For a lot of people, you know, and then uh, so I save that time and that expense and whatever the carbon impact of driving, whatever you want to say the benefit is. I'll go there, do my three jobs, and then I have like four quotes to do in that area too that I've like saved up. But if I were to like, yeah, like you said, bring a bike with me, which just so happens my helper is like hardcore cyclist. Um, we could drop a bike and a guy and he could go around and do like quotes while we're there like working and just like save on that and tag yeah. team it. And yeah, I try and ride my motorbike actually quite a bit. It's still a vehicle, but it's a lot better than uh, a big truck. And I know sometimes I'm tempted to like take the truck because it has all the decaling and the logos and people see it. But again, it's like parking's a pain in the ass. And honestly, I don't want to pay for the fuel. It's ridiculous. So I'll just take like a, my four cylinder like tiny truck or a motorbike to as many quotes and different things like that that I can. Yeah, it's which it's is more something. Fun too, I guess at least you get a ride. It out is of more it. fun. It's so yeah. it's so boring driving around, but if you're on a motorbike or a, or a bike, a cyclist, yeah, it's it's a lot more fun. Yeah. So how I did think this? That's uh, why a lot of people. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, you go ahead first. Cause I'm gonna change topics on you. Oh no! It's just I think that that's why when you are riding your bike or or and you're on the sharing it with cars, I think that's why a lot of people tend to get frustrated with you because they'd probably rather be on the bike, but they're not. They're like <laughs> slowed down yeah. by you, and they're like, oh. But maybe yeah. so, sorry, maybe Kurt, though I interrupted you there though. Oh yeah, no worries. I was just reminiscing to all the times that I've been honked at or whatever. 
And then I w- when I was younger, I'd get honked at and I'd just give people the finger. And I, man, so many people would hammer the brakes and like pull over, like they're gonna fight me. And I'm like, really? Oh my god! Like, <laughs> how angry are you? It is. It like is I'm riding really a bike, funny. man, on the shoulder. Yeah. Like, and it's so funny. Anyway, that, anyway like they just, they're jealous of the spandex I was wearing. Yeah, the light <laughs> Yeah, and that's the, light the other thing with the diaper like, in it. Yeah, imagine if Clogger made like cycling jerseys and Lycra chainsaw pants, just like skin tight. You know, we'd be all yeah. over that. You know what I love is those like Naomi uh, tree climbing shirts that are all like purple and they're like tight and they're breathable and they're all flashy. Those are sweet too. Yeah, I haven't seen. I, those. I do think that our border culture in general does need a sort of like fashion reconciliation yeah like some of our stuff looks good but like really like if you wear clogger pants no offense clogger outside of any tree work group people are like like who called the power rangers it's like what is that yeah yeah i want to get some of those denims you had the denims on one day i kind of like those yeah they're fine but again the pockets like yeah, yeah. Just keep it simple, you know? Fashion. Anyways, it's work gear, so it doesn't have to be fashionable, I guess. Yeah, I probably shouldn't be hanging out and picking up dates with your chainsaw pants on or whatever, but going to meet your mother in law for dinner. Yeah. But, anyways, how did. Uh, so, Spoken Loam, the Urban Forestry Conference. This is the first one, yeah. right? Uh, it is the first one, yeah. So, if people want to check that out. Oh, actually. Before we go to that, where can people go and look up stuff you were talking about where you said those other companies were doing this and they have these cool setups? And like, is there pictures online or places you can go, like YouTube channels, whatever, of people doing this so they can see it? Um, you can look up um, Tree Imagineers. I think so. A lot of these guys aren't big on social media, but there's, a, there's quite a few people in Europe. People feel free to hit okay. me up and I can link them up. I don't know them all off the top of my head, but there's some pretty cool, like Larry vs. Harry are the bikes that I use and they're always posting really cool stuff. And Carla Cargo is another um, tool. Like it's a, it's a bike trailer and it's like uh, its own trailer brakes and everything and they're pretty sweet. But there's quite a few people on... Um, on the internet doing this well they're not okay. doing it on the internet they're doing it in real life but uh most of them are in europe and then we got guys like kevin bingham who just ride a normal bike to do some tree work and then we got divine arboriculture out on the coast and that's sort of spurring its own little movement as well with people trying it out and there's surprisingly there's a ton of people that have been doing this in forestry and, and trail maintenance online. And I just sort of figured this out because I did a presentation hmm. on this subject. And when I was doing a bit of research, there's a lot of people doing fuel management and stuff uh, by e-bike. And so they've built like custom frames that fit their chainsaws on them. And they, they use them to get into the back country and they can service trails that used to take them days or helicopter in or hike in. They can bike in and out get them done in way less time so it's pretty sweet yeah and i i've seen like some of those silky saws that you can fold are pretty intense you can cut some pretty big logs with those or they have like pretty lightweight yeah like almost like a chainsaw type chain that you can put sticks through the handles i've seen that and you can go back and forth and cut through some pretty large wood if you had to move a piece of wood out of the way because they're out there mountain biking anyways so yeah i guess yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool and electric chainsaws yeah, you yeah. can fit you can fit a lot on these bikes, so like I have no problem fitting all my gear on them. But yeah, um people can hit me up online. Um Okay. My social media is the Crooked Tree Arborist. Something like that. At Yay. the Crooked Tree Arborist. Yeah. Um And that's your website that. as well. Um my website is is on there. Um Okay. So yeah, my Instagram is I'll put it in the notes anyways, uh on yeah, the, the crooked on the, tree on the show notes. That's it. Crooked and tree that's the name for the now. Crooked tree. We might I don't know, don't ask me how that came up. 
Um, but yeah, we might, I might change the name to something a little different in a couple of years to reflect okay. more of the biking aspect of it. But for now, that's what it is. Yeah. Emmy Weckworth, so, though. Google yeah. it. Um, okay, so then we're going spoken low. Spoken. Spoken low. S P O K E N. Yeah. Spoken low. L O A M. dot C A. Yeah. So for this urban June twenty first. June twenty first. Yeah. Okay. June twenty first. So the longest day of the year, I think. Solstice. Solstice. Edmonton, Alberta, which yep. is a pretty sweet place to be in the summer. Uh, nine to five p.m. If if you need your CEUs, there's seven and a half CEUs available there if you're an isa certified arborist uh we got some pretty awesome talks happening um tickets are selling super fast so if you haven't gotten your ticket yet um get on top of that but 100 bucks uh, a ticket basic right? 100 bucks a ticket includes lunch and there's going to be lots of swag and lots of giveaways you're going to meet some cool people there too from within the industry and we're trying to make it a little bit more uh, intersectional and interdisciplinary so we got people from the horticulture from the nursery style stuff and a lot of like urban gardeners will be there and so yeah we've brought in speakers in from mostly within Canada and one uh, group of guys from the Michigan area so we oh, okay got Dave that Luke's, was uh... uh tree first tree first they looked really cool yeah, be... I, I can't wait to s- yeah. see their thing yeah actually maybe talk you can about, line up uh, an interview with them yeah may, yeah definitely after i'm hoping to meet some of these people from the from the conference and then maybe connect yeah. with them after but it looked like they were talking about it kind of exactly what i'm trying to do with uh the arborist blueprint here is just explore like the fringes of a boar culture and other options as being an arborist as opposed to like just that traditional way we talked about which is great but there's so much info and everything out there for that already that people maybe not even realize that they can go into a boar culture and focus more on planting or focus more on tree preservation or health assessments yeah. or like whatever it might be and build their niche up or like you with cargo bikes whatever it might be right exactly yeah no there that's gonna be a really cool presentation we got dave lutz out of manitoba he's gonna be presenting on um it's a talk called uh, Flea on an Elephant's Back, and it is our boar culture from an indigenous perspective. And that one's going to be awesome because it's also going to be on um, National Indigenous Day here in Canada. Oh, so really? we got, yeah. And then after that, we got Katie Brukers, who's going to be doing a really cool talk on how climate change is affecting uh, fungal uh, pathogens and how we understand them. There's some pretty interesting patterns that she's been able to. Uh, find through some of her research with University of Moncton, New Brunswick, I believe. Um, and we got cool. a lady named Dana Dana Green. Dana Green. I got a last name. Yeah. Bat ecologist Dana Green. Yeah. So she is a bat ecologist, and she's going to be talking about um, tree roosting bats and how we can be aware of them. A lot of them are protected. Um, and be aware of their habitats, especially in urban settings. So Tree Roosting Bats of North America is the title of her talk. And it's going to be really cool because we do tend to forget about the Migratory Bird Act as well, in especially in yeah. Alberta. And if you do remember, that's kind of like the only thing. It's like, oh, there's a bird. Is it migratory? Okay, we shouldn't cut it down. Whether that actually happens yeah. or not, that's another story. But... It's like, well, what about how come we're deeming migratory birds as being, you know, the one thing that will not cut the tree down for, but everything else, it's like fair game. <laughs> it's like, yeah, who drew that yeah, line? Like bats, and exactly. Bats, flying squirrels. There's lots of stuff that we're not aware of. And I think that's just kind of, you know, as, as the industry grows and as we get more public engagement, maybe we'll be held accountable a little bit more. Um, then we'll never be allowed to cut a tree down. <laughs> Yeah, only the only the <laughs> ones that really need to come down. Yeah, I yeah. suppose that could that could happen, but I don't think that's the case. I think if you look at case studies of where there have been, and it is something that I do want to work on, is places that have had tree bylaws and and sort of protections. Mm-hmm. It's not bad for business. It's not bad for tree care companies. 
you know, it is bad for the companies who don't do their due diligence and don't work safely and do work literally at night, um, fly by night. But for the rest of us, it's actually really good. And it's really good for a number of things, right? Uh, it And bylaws aren't the be-all, end-all, and it's not the, the only solution. I think cultural change is a little bit more important than than sort of governing things and and that sort of aspect but it is a start uh so yeah so that's yeah anyways back on track here so dana green will be talking about migratory or tree roosting bats of north america which interesting enough interestingly enough a lot of them are migratory which is really cool uh, hmm. and then we got so we talked about katie brukers as well we got uh, Yang Fei, who's uh, working on a heritage goji project here in Edmonton, and she's linking it back to Chinese heritage. She's a local artist. She's got some really cool exhibits, actually, on Ada Boulevard. She made a, a big, it's a big pig out of recycled, uh, I think, like the the beer can, like plastic caps. She made a really cool uh, art installation. Um, okay. So she's an artist and historian, and that will be part of presentation as well. And then we got. Uh, yeah, she seemed a bit. She seemed like on the, definitely on the fringes, like uh, compared to the other presenters there with like the goji berry yeah. and different things. So that's going to be a total learning experience, I think, for me and everyone that's there. Yeah. The living it's history of goji like, in Edmonton. It's related to tree work, but it's not like a full. You're not getting a full CEU for that one, so we're get, giving you guys half oh, a CEU gotcha. for that talk. Um, so that's where the seven and a half comes in. So and we're we're gonna have other people come coming and talking about some things uh, here and there in between talks when we have the time. But we also have um, Dustin Bezier, who's uh, mapping heritage trees in Alberta, and he's Is got he, some uh, really cool kind of co-hosting it with you. Yeah, so he's a co-host. Um, and and I have my myself as a as a backup presenter in case someone doesn't show up because I will be presenting on actually cargo bikes and just micro mobility and tree care at, at uh, Okotoks this fall at the ISA okay. conference. And so we also got Tony um, Tony Marie Newsham and Charlene Scott who are going to be talking about like what we do to trees now and how th those sort of actions that we take can be seen in future generations. So not just that, but species selection, planting, pruning, the whole gamut of things that we do now and how they can affect future generations and how we should be sensitive to that and care about that. And cool. How many did I name? Am I missing any? I think, yeah, I'm looking at this, the site, so I got... We got Dana Green, the bat ecologist. Katie Brukers, she's oh, an yeah. ISA arborist. Yeah, she said first, the, yeah. The fungal pathogens. Young Faye, Dave Lutz, uh, indigenous stuff. You didn't say too much about Dustin, but he's. Uh, what does Dustin do again? So he's going to be doing a presentation on mapping trees for preservation and climate resilience. So Dustin, he's kind of a lot like you he's our like local um he's a lot like atmos but it's not really um working as closely with arborists what he does is something called shrub scriber and it's basically a propagation subscription so you can subscribe to his service and and he'll send you seeds and they're always locally sourced and it's usually within the edmonton area and people can propagate those but he's also been working on a really cool, um, a really cool project with the Edmonton Heritage Council on mapping heritage trees, um, and kind of knowing oh, yeah. where they are, so that we can be aware of those and where their seeds uh, can be harvested and and that sort of thing, so that we can be a little bit more resilient in the face of climate change, which is really affecting a lot of that for us in yeah. all sorts so all parts of the world so. and I mean just if and we then, could get more into the habit of sourcing seeds from the existing trees in our climate to be planted here that would be 
amazing. It only makes sense. But a lot of these problems yeah. we all face in a board culture are from trees that are big big department type store places where they're shipped in from a greenhouse with synthetic fertilizers and shot up super quick, sent out here and they're too deep and you know, everyone knows the story yeah. and there's a lot of challenges then we're trying to overcome all of the the diseases and everything that uh they're susceptible to when they're not as resilient because they're not even a seed from the genetics in our area yeah and the i mean big nursery companies that yeah there's probably some ways to do better but that would be i know it's not as feasible but maybe we can find ways to do that yeah. he's got some good information well yeah i mean i think community forestry is what we're all talking about right it's not just what Kurt and Emmy do on a day-to-day -day basis that's going to make our urban forests more resilient and, and bomb-proof, I guess you could say. It's a whole community effort. Like, you can have, just because you have doctors, you know, you can have more doctors doesn't mean people aren't going to get sick. And I guess that's not the yeah. best comparison, but you, you do need to, there is a lot that you can do as a patient or as a non-tree worker that really does help your trees and we have to be aware that the public we're part of the public often when we say we need to educate people a lot of people don't want to be educated about trees and they don't care to be educated so I think that's where cultural shift and a cultural change needs to happen and I think I personally think that philosophically you know I don't know if any of you have read uh, anything about social ecology but it's it's really cool because it links us back to nature in a way that is a little bit more feasible and it makes sense not just nature but our ecological well-being, how that's actually tied into our social well-being and our economic well-being, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I guess that segues to Tree First, which is going to be doing a cool presentation. So Jeremiah Sandler and Jack Novak out of the Michigan area, they're going to be talking about exactly what you're sort of um, touching base on earlier, Kurt, which is more creative ways of doing tree work. Like we don't all need to do the same thing we don't all need to have bucket trucks and chippers and not saying that those don't have a place in a, a really you know applicable use case scenario yeah but for a lot of us a lot of the bigger problems that especially in this economic environment that we're facing a lot of those problems can be solved by not owning as much equipment and yeah. I hate to say it, but that is a solution to a lot of us, right? Sometimes the best solutions aren't adding things. They're just taking things away. Yeah, I like that. It's, it kind of takes away a lot of the burden and stress, honestly, day to day with business and trying to run a business and just really simplifying. It's like it's like purging your house of all the crap you don't need and having that garage sale or whatever. And you're just like, ah, oh, I feel lighter. Like I don't have all these things because they, they always say like all the things that you own end up owning you <laughs> you're like yeah. tied down to it you know but i don't know i don't know if everyone has that feeling sometimes where you just want to peace out and grab like a van and just head out and spend some time with nothing i think that's why we're all drawn to like camping and different things like because really like why would you leave your house to go you know some campsite most of them aren't even that great but you know you bring all this stuff and you cook it all like it's just a pain in the butt, <laughs> kind of when you look at it objectively, but we're all kind of yeah. drawn to this like simplicity of just making your own food without having many things with you and then spending time sitting around a fire and whatever. So there's, there's something about that. I mean, that can be applied, yeah. like you said, to business and strip it down maybe a little bit and lighten things up or rethink your objectives as a business. And I just talked to uh, Jason DiPietro on my last podcast and he was an arborist and did contract climbing for years and years and then he woke up one day and was like I can't I can't kill another tree he's like I've killed way too many he had some sort of epiphany and was like I'm only planting trees now and completely did a 180 and switched his business 
and I've always had this impression like, oh, you can't like feasibly plant trees for a business. And he's doing like great. Like there's there's tons of projects. There's like so much demand of so many places that need trees planted. So like they do solar powered irrigation and like go to diff all sorts of different areas and work tons right in town, like right in the city. They're going home every night to their families, whatever. And, you know, they go on occasional kind of trips together, planting trees. And it sounds awesome. Like it, it's great. And they're doing it like in the right way, like eco reforestation, um, you know, permaculture mindsets and background and good business philosophy. And they're, they have a ton of employees and they're, they're profitable and whatever. Yeah, I mean, so it's just not we gotta be creative. I think that I totally agree with that. It's like I think there's a lot of money to be made in selling uh, equipment and and whatnot. And so I don't want to say that that's not necessary. I mean, people do make a living out of that. That's great, but we don't all need that. We definitely don't. Like a lot of our chippers are just sitting around. And if every tree company has the exact same equipment or the does the same thing and we're all just like you know competing with each other I don't think that leaves us a lot of room for creativity and I think that there's so much room to improve a lot of the the other things that we do like consultation and planting and soil remediation and phytoremediation and and all these aspects that sort of get pawned off to to often other sort of domains of arboriculture or urban foresters who's your typical arborist could benefit a lot from just being able to make a tree grow a little bit quicker in a natural yeah. sort of like holistic way and then go back and prune it but as we said earlier like if your tools are designed to cut trees and dispose of them then it's going to be your go-to so yeah yeah for sure sweet man well i appreciate you uh give me your time i know you're super busy out there training and whatever you're not even at home <laughs> right now but we've in been trying to my hotel yeah in your beauty hotel does it yeah. have the same the same picture above your is there two paintings on the wall that are the same picture twice no there's that's how i judge different. whether they're all like no, they're, it's not that bad. There's actually three frames in here, and they're all <laughs> slightly different. Sweet. Um, but it I, does smell a bit dank because we're in Vancouver. Oh. So, yeah. You know. Well, that could be good or bad, depending on <laughs> yeah. who we are. Not the good type of dank. Okay. Not the good type. Yikes. Okay, sweet. Well, I guess yeah. everyone can... Uh, it, was there anything else you wanted to add or, or put in? I'm just assuming... Um, that you're probably no i, I think on, but... uh awesome podcast kurt and if you haven't subscribed and shared it to other people do that thank you for having me on here i'm i'm very honored to be on here and um hopefully uh when you're at uh spoken loam maybe we can get a group of uh some of the speakers to do a little group uh recording if we can figure that out i'm sure they're going to be we're going to be drinking beers for sure, so it might be a little bit noisier than normal, but hey, it's live <laughs> live, uh, live shows are sometimes fun to, to do that sort of thing with. So, Yeah, I'm looking forward to connecting with everybody, you and everyone that's coming and whatever. It looks going to be exciting. And My brother lives in Edmonton, so I'm excited to come see him too and spend the night. And Awesome. Yeah, man. Should be good. So uh, I'll put all this stuff in the show notes uh, as far as how to contact you if they're interested in learning more about cargo bikes or uh, want to come hit up the Spoken Loam uh, Urban Forestry Conference. I'll be sharing some of these clips here right away so we can try and get it out. Do you? How many spots do you have Cheers, left? You know? Um, we're nearing the hundred mark and we sell out okay. at one twenty. So. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. We'll try and push lost. Yeah, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Don't uh, don't hang up or exit yet. We'll uh, let it finish here uploading. Perfect. Okay, take care, buddy. Cheers.